My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I'm speaking with Daryl Williams. He is a 20-year veteran of the United States Army. He retired as a Sergeant First Class. He spent 30 years working in the federal government. During his military career, he traveled as an operations and vice presidential communications officer, leading over 500 White House missions. Following the, the tragedy, tragedies of September 11th, 2001, Daryl was selected as one of five key leaders from 30 senior managers to direct emergency action communications for the Vice President of the United States to include duties as an Air Force II command representative. Now, currently, he works as a master certified life coach and is a member of the Federal Coaching Network. He's an inspirational speaker and certified facilitator who provides clients with expertise in the realm of leadership, relationships, and purpose. Now he takes his uh, experience from uh, the, his 30 year career within the federal government, uh, 20 years in the United States Army. We'll, we'll get into that in a, in a few, but um, one thing that is, uh, is pretty interesting. Daryl grew up in Compton, was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and then moved to Compton uh, at the age of two years old. You were living in Compton when you joined the Army. Did, did your time in Compton uh, kind of lead you to, to decide, I, I want to join the Army? Um, yeah. Absolutely. First of all, thanks for having me, Dave, man. Appreciate it so much. And you're exactly right. Um, growing up in Compton definitely uh, was a leading factor for me to join the Army. Um, at the time that I was um, right around my junior year, uh, when I got ready to join um, the delayed entry program, Compton was the fourth most dangerous city in the United States at that time, right? So those that saw the movie Boys in the Hood, that was the culture that I grew up in. And then the movie Straight Outta Compton was the culture that my younger brothers and sister grew up in. So whenever I meet people and they remember I was from Compton, they're like, hey, did they add anything new to that movie that wasn't true? I was like, nope, everything you saw was exactly the way it was. And I always tell people when I joined the military, I didn't even know that helicopters did not fly over people's homes because that was just an everyday thing for us growing up in that uh, situation. Wow. And, and what did your, what did your mom and dad do uh, for a living uh, back then when you were a kid? So my dad worked for Owens Corning and Fiberglass, right? Just worked with his hands a lot. My mom was a seamstress. Uh, I believe when I joined the army, she was working for Simpsons um, design race team, which basically they were making like the uniform for the race car drivers, which I thought was kind of cool, right? And, uh, but definitely we're not making a lot of money. We didn't have money for college. Um, it was just one of those situations where you don't know what you don't know, right? Because everybody else around you is kind of in a similar situation. Um, but I knew that I definitely wanted to leave, you know, a lot of the violence, right? Growing up in that area, a lot of gang violence, heavily drug infested, and, you know, still a lot of great people there, you know, but still just growing up in that environment, you just knew there has to be something different out there. And, you know, if it is, I want to be a part of it. You said you had a younger brother. Is it just you and your brother? So I had two younger brothers and one younger sister. Oh, nice. So you're the oldest? 
I am the oldest and definitely carried that burden of wanting to try to set the example, right? So they knew like, okay, if he didn't screw up, then that means I can't screw up, right? So that was what I was hoping with all of my decisions that I made at that time. Did, did any of your siblings join the service? Funny you would mention that. All three of them actually joined. Um, and I like to think that I had something to do with that, right? Uh, and one of them retired just like I did, um, the other two, uh, got out after their first enlistment, but again, the um, training, the leadership, the discipline that they got definitely carried them on uh, to success in their lives now. Can you tell me about um, your your path into communications in the Army? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I would imagine you had to kind of work your way into that. It didn't just fall in your lap. Absolutely. So the funny part, it actually starts back um, my senior year of high school, right? Um, I had joined the military. Well, I was a, finished up high school. And I don't know if you remember, David, back then, that's when the rap scene started, right? So it was coming out very early, right? Only East Coast rappers, no West Coast rappers at that time. And our school was so bad, right? The principal was trying to think outside of the box. Like, how do I get this violence under control? And he came up with this idea that, you know what, I'm gonna bring a DJ in here and we're gonna play music at lunchtime. But the only difference is, or the key to it is, if the violence stops, we'll keep it going. If the violence keeps going, we're gonna cut it. And it just seemed like Dave, all the gangsters, you know, kind of got the word and kind of put the word out like, hey God, let's call the truce. We don't wanna mess this up, right? So one of my friends was the DJ. And as he was preparing, he's like, hey, I wanna need some guys to, you know, kind of rap on the mic to kind of, you know, break it up a little bit. So I, I took that as an opportunity, like, hey, I need to be one of those guys. So I started preparing myself and typing up my rhymes. And eventually that led to uh, um, you know, a lot of street cred, as you would say back then, right? I was able to go to different parts of neighborhoods that other people couldn't go to because, hey, that's the guy that used to rap at Compton, right? But I knew that that wasn't something that I could put my hat on at that time, right? And I remember I met a recruiter and I didn't want to talk to him, Dave. It was like, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. I don't have time for this. And he was like, no, really, what are you going to do when you get, you know, when you graduate? And I was like, I don't know, go to college. And he thought, okay, what college are you going to go to? It was like, uh, University of Arkansas, right? Came to my mind. And he opened up this book, Dave. I don't know what it was, but it just showed me like, this is how much it costs for an undergraduate degree at the University of Arkansas. And this is what it costs for a graduate degree. And right then and there, it's like, that was my aha moment. It's like, okay, life is about to get serious. I need to get serious. And it was like, tell me more about this army, right? And we started talking and I was like, okay, so if I go into the army, I want to be a businessman. And he was like, well, there's no business in the army, right? The army is a business. We're in the business of defending this country and things of that nature. So I'm like, well, what's close to that? And then we started talking and I, he asked me, well, what can you do? And I said, well, I can type. And he was like, good, you can go in as administrative human resource person, right? And I'm like, oh, cool, that'll work. And that's really how I went into the army, right? As a military human resource person. But the good thing about that, Dave, is with those type of jobs, you can work at anywhere, right? You can work in a communications organization, of military intelligence, right? Logistics, it didn't matter. They all needed someone to handle the military HR piece. So my first assignment was in Germany right, did that for a couple of years. And then one of the sergeant majors, right, one of the highest ranks in the army, kind of saw me, saw me competing in all these competition boards and was like, hey, I need to talk to you before you leave Germany. And I'm like, okay. And he was like, so what are you, you know, where are you going after this? Like, I'm going to Fort Hood, Texas. I'm a soldier, right? I'm gonna make Sergeant Major like you. And Dave, he changed my assignment, right? He was like, nah, I'm gonna send you somewhere different. I'm like, why? And he was like, there's this thing called special assignments in the military. Not everybody can get them, but I just think that you have what it takes um, to kind of operate in that environment. And it was funny, Dave, because sometimes in life, you don't know what you're good at, right, until somebody else kind of sees those things in you. And that was one of those moments where, you know, he changed my assignment, I ended up going to the Pentagon, and you would think I'd be grateful, right? But I really didn't like it, right? It was different than what I was used to. I was used to soldiering and, you know, keeping your boots shined and your uniform press and, you know, that type of assignment, you didn't wear uniforms, right? You wore like your dress, 
bees, right? Kind of a dress up type of uniform. Like I can't stand out like that. Everybody else looks just like me. I need to stand out. But it taught me a lesson that sometimes the places that you don't want to go are really the places that you need to be because it's not about right trying to get through life so quickly but it's about enjoying the journey and figuring out what leadership lesson is it trying to teach you so i ended up you know kind of changing my mindset and just doing the best that i could and then i got picked up at that time for the white house communications agency because they had a recruiting team that went all around the world right trying to bring in the best of the best army navy air force marines and uh, when they recruited me, it was funny because I wasn't even trying to go there. I was just trying to get a day off because they came like on a Friday. And I was telling one of my friends, like, man, if we go to this interview at 10 o'clock, finish by noon, we're off for the rest of the day and we can goof off. And then months later, he gets a notice saying he didn't get accepted. I get one that says, you are accepted. And I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute. What did I sign up for again? What was that interview about? <laughs> I mean, it was really bad. Like, okay, what is this about to happen in my life? And that's when I got introduced to the White House Communications Agency, right? An agency that supports the president, vice president, Secret Service, White House staff, and those um, appointed as directed. And our whole mission was to provide communications, right, to these senior leaders in the government. And just an amazing experience. If you're talking about just regular Army, Air Force, Navy, you know, Marine members, you know, learning this new concept and putting it all together as teams right, to support, you know, the president and the vice president. Wow. And then after that, when, when you retired, you went back to the White House and mm -hmm. you were telling me um, you, you served there training people to do what you had been doing. Correct. I had a really great career there, right? I was there two different times, right? The first time I traveled as an operations officer, which is kind of like a first sergeant on the road. Uh, they're the officer in charge, and then you're kind of running all the logistics, right? So this is you know, way back in the day, tell them my age, Dave, right? This is when one person paid for everybody's room, everybody's cars, right? I had to work with the embassy if we were doing overseas trips, right? All this took leadership, and that was the great thing that it taught me was, you know, there's always a higher level of leadership that you can go. And sometimes you don't get to those levels until you're challenged until you're brought into situations where you don't see how can I maintain this level of um, expertise and not make a mistake, right? So I did that for about six years, um, got really good at it, just wanted to do something different, called my branch manager and he was like, hey, um, you know, what's going on? I was like, hey man, I wanna leave the White House to try something different. And he was like, what are you, are you in trouble or something? I'm like, no, no, I'm in good standing. I'm at the top of my game. I just want to get my boots dirty again. And, he ended up sending me to Korea, I went there with a military intelligence unit, um, became a platoon sergeant there, still did some HR stuff. Great assignment, you know, chance to and mentor some younger soldiers. Then I came back to the White House and that's when I started traveling with the vice president at that time, Vice President Gore. Then I uh, started doing some things with Vice President Cheney and then uh, eventually traveled on the Air Force too. And even though it was at the top of my game and I really love taking care of people, I just had this thought, Dave, that, you know, the longer I stay here, the longer I'm blocking somebody else. I know that's not the mindset for most people, but that was just my mindset, right? And I remember saying, I was gonna retire right at 20, regardless of, right, where I was. And when I got out, I wanted to be a motivational speaker because I figured, man, with all this experience coming from Compton, right, flying on Air Force Two, it's gotta be able to inspire and motivate somebody else. And um, I, was, I was setting up that business and I was trying to do it locally because I didn't want to travel a lot because I just had a young son. And I told my wife, hey, I'm not going to travel anymore. Right? I know how the strain that is on a marriage. And I was like, okay, let me find like just a local job, just something to kind of keep me going. And it was so funny. I dialed a number to our agency that I thought was something. And they were like, nope, that's not the job here. They transferred me. And I don't know how life is today, but you know how sometimes things work out and you're like, hi, in the heck did that happen? The lady transferred me to the White House Communications AC Training Academy. I didn't even know they existed at that time because I traveled so much, right? It was, that was like a blur. And then when the person answered the phone, it sounded like one of my old radio technicians that I used to travel with. So I'm like, hey, is this so-and-so? And they were like, how do you know my name? And who are you? 
And then when I told her my name, she's like, oh my gosh, what are you doing nowadays? And I'm like, oh, I'm looking for a job now, ready to get back in the job market. And she was like, hey, I'm at the training academy and we need somebody to teach operations officers. And right, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, when I got out, I was at the vice presidential level. So I wasn't really doing that anymore. She was like, yeah, but you probably could still do it. I said, I probably could. So she transferred me to the contractor lead at that time. Um, and we started talking and he was like, yep, you're the perfect person for the job. Um, we trust you, we know you can do it. And I ended up, that's how I went to the training academy, right? And it's so funny, some of the information that they were using, um, a lot of it, not all, but a lot of it was some of the regulations and you know, um, the things that I had wrote back in the day to kind of make everybody you know, kind of do the same thing and help training to be a little bit better. It was like, those were some of the principles they were still using, right? Definitely some of the, uh, the way they did it changed obviously over the years, but the bottom line principles of the leadership piece of it was actually still there. So it was just a great opportunity. So now, right, I'm leaving this new legacy because I'm training the people that came behind me and still having an actual good excuse to be able to share some old war stories about, hey, back in my day, this is what we had to deal with, but not in a sense of, you know, knocking them, but just letting them know that, hey, the same way we were great back then, you guys are going to be even better. It's really something else. And do you still do any training there at the training academy or? So I don't do any training there because I work for another agency now. But since I'm a part of the White House Communications Alumni Association, right, I get to go back once a month because they have like the new employee orientation. So I feel very blessed and honored that I get to go back once a month and talk about the association and kind of little th things that we offer. Um, but also, again, I get to just drop some nuggets and, you know, I, I know they felt just like I felt back then. You're nervous. You're proud and happy to be there, but there's a part of you was like, okay, how do I succeed with all these type A personalities and this mission where if we make a mistake, possibly the whole world can see it, right? So I use that opportunity just to like, hey, anybody have any questions, you know, anything you want to just ask, you know, because I want you to feel at ease and know that, you know, the reason you're in this agency and uh, you have something to offer, right? So I get to do that and then um, about a couple of months ago, I was really honored um, to go back and I was recognized as, you know, one of the best of the best. So I was actually inducted into the White House Communications Agency Hall of Fame um, back in June. So again, man, everything all tied to leadership and taking care of people. Incredible. So along your, your path to, um, to the Hall of Fame, right? what... Um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned uh, maybe from some of the, the individuals that mentored you mm -hmm. uh, coming up? Uh, great question, Dave. Uh, the one thing is like you just said, the first key is finding that mentor, right? I don't care what part of life you're in right now, what industry you're a part of. Um, if you really wanna make a dent in this world, right? You will find a mentor because there's always somebody greater than you, somebody that's walked that path before you. But interesting enough, they want to give back, right? A lot of mentors are looking for somebody to kind of share those pearls of wisdom because they know they can't take it with them. So if you're you know, humble enough, right? That's the key to be humble to say, hey, I like what Dave Hollenbach is doing. I wanna be that way as well, right? Let me connect with Dave and really kind of put myself, right? As a student, right, to learn, you know, not just how to be a great podcaster, but Dave, what made you into who you are, right, what the podcasting is just, right, the vehicle that you use, but you're greater than the vehicle, that's why I always tell people when I speak at the schools, you know, there's something inside of all of us, but we just got to figure out how do we, you know, get that thing out and shine it up and make it work, so for me, definitely the been getting a mentor was huge, other thing was uh, getting accountability partners, right? A lot of times in life, um, you need someone that can hold you accountable. Somebody that's gonna say, well, wait a minute, Dave, you told me a year from now, you wanted to start this podcast. So what are you doing, right? 
what, what step are you on, right? What do you need help with, right? Because the accountability partner helps you stay on that road of success and um, very valuable tool to anybody. And that's one of the things I learned, right? Mentor, accountability partner. And then the other thing too is you know, finding ways to I always say maximize your call. To me, Dave, everybody in life has a calling on their life. I don't care if it's just to be a dad, a mom, right? College professor, firefighter, right? Those, to me, those things are a calling. So now my thing is, when I talk to people is, well, how do you maximize your call, right? How do you get the most out of whatever that is? And you're not comparing yourself to uh, previous firefighters or previous soldiers or airmen. All you're doing is comparing yourself to yourself. Right. How do I get the most out of all my gifts and talents where I make a difference in my organization, right, in my family life and in the world? And when you can, you know, line yourself up to maximize your call, that can take on any form, whether it's extra training, right, getting a higher degree, right? It could just be also if you're not going to college, right, but going to some type of job skill program. It doesn't matter. I always tell young people the great thing about success is there is no true blueprint. Yeah, there are some habits, but the blueprint of success can be a lot of different things. They can take on a lot of different paths. Yeah, it's funny that you should say that. Um, when, when you read about these super successful individuals, mm -hmm. you find that they, they create their own path. That's right. And it, it's typically you know, original, you know, mm -hmm. like they, they have the, uh, a lot of habits in common with yes. other successful people, but how they, how they become really just super successful is they, they create that for themselves. And I just think that's really cool that you should mention that. No, you're right. And a lot of that comes from, you know, again, what's driving you, right? It's not just your purpose, but, you know, what's your passion? Like I used to always tell people, they often say, well, so what are you, right? Are you a teacher, right? Are you a soldier? Are you a motivational speaker? You know, I'm like, I'm a leader, right? And all those other things are vehicles, right? And opportunities that give me a chance to operate in my gift. So that's why I always try to tell people, especially, you know, do military transition coaching, right? It's don't get caught up on what you were while you were in the service. Don't get caught up on when you retire, like, man, I was, you know, one of the greatest firefighters ever. Now I'm about to retire. What's next for me? The same drive that made you that great firefighter, that great soldier, that great business leader or teacher is still in you. Only thing that life is trying to do now is shift you to a different way where you can still continue to give back. Because I always believed that, you know, I wouldn't fly on Air Force Two for myself, right? I was flying on Air Force Two to open up a door for somebody else that came behind me that's flying on there right now, right? I don't even know their name, right? But to know that I was one of the original five that started that program, you know, there's somebody coming after me, right? So I just tell people, you know, don't look at what you were, look at those things that got you to the place that you were. And then now how do you shift, right? Because I always get a lot of people that say, well, Darrell, you know, how, how do I know what I'm supposed to do next, right? Teaching with my life. I'm like, well, first of all, change your mindset. Teaching with a part of your life doesn't mean you have to stop teaching. You just might have to find a different way of teaching, right? And some people say, well, how do you find your passion? And to me, it's easy. Right. To me, you find your passion by trying to figure out where is there a need in my community that I can meet. Like, no, you don't understand. I'm trying to make money. I understand that. And that's for a different topic. You probably want to talk to a business person. But for me, when you're talking about passion and purpose, to me, that equals meeting a need, being a part of something bigger than yourself. Now, by chance, there could be a way where you could make money from doing that passion. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I always tell people, you know, look at meeting the need first, because from what I've seen, the money follows the method. Yeah, I've, I've had that, the, the conversation surrounding purpose and passion mm -hmm. with, with several other guests. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's an interesting topic because a lot of times 
we struggle to to really define our purpose for ourselves and sure. you know and, and nobody else can do it for us we've got to we've got to define our purpose for ourselves and yes. and when you're when you're talking about passion or a passion mm-hmm. really following what something that you're passionate about mm-hmm. something that you know you could do if you weren't getting paid for it correct um something that you could do forever yes. because you enjoy it it means something to you and 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 that i think is kind of how you find your purpose yes so I, i'm i'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how mm-hmm. you found your purpose got it so one of the things i used to do dave was so funny right um i'm also when i was traveling right i was a youth worker Right. So, you know, one of the greatest jobs I had wasn't paid for it, but it gave me the most meaning. Right. Because you're developing these young minds. Right. They're watching you. And one thing I used to do, I'll tell people all the time, man, I was the biggest thief that you can imagine. And meaning that if the army has something, I was stealing it and taking it back to the community. Right. And I used to steal every leadership principle, every leadership guide, right? Whatever it was, man, I would find a way to bring that to the community. So if I was working with youth, right, I'd find some leadership principles that they could kind of, you know, tackle, work around. And again, the whole point of it, right, it wasn't to do anything other than I care about this generation, right? I don't want to be one of those old guys like, oh, look at these kids, right? They're not going to be anything. They're not going to do anything. It was like, no, I want to be one of the people that actually make a difference. I want to reach out there and like, hey, where do you want to go, right? What are you trying to do? And for me, again, it came back to trying to meet the need in the community. It's like, well, you know, you sure you want to do this job? Because you said you travel a lot. I'm like, that's okay, right? When I'm not traveling, I'll be here. But if you can stand, you know, being away, me being away sometimes, that's fine. Because I told them that the good news is every place that I travel, Right, I can bring back some of those experiences and teach the young people. So I think for me, it was more of, and I had to, you know, realize this day. It was like, you know, what am I good at? Right, I'm good at leading. I'm good at training. Right, I'm good at encouraging. Right. So once I found out what I was good at, then I matched that with, okay, where is there a need where I can do those things that I am good at? And then I found out even doing the military HR, like even in my agency now, hey, I do military HR, but my real passion is I help people. I help people to become the best, whatever it is that they want to be. And I'm still doing that, right? It's just, I have a different way of doing it now. And to me, that's what helped me was figuring out what are the things that I was good at? And then where was the need? And how do I match what I'm good at to meet that particular need. And did you discover these talents while you were in the army or did you kind of have a, a sense already, um, you know, as, as a young man in, in Compton that, that you had these skills at leadership and. So great question. So I didn't recognize the skills in Compton but one thing I used to do, I was very observant, right? So I would watch, and believe it or not, like the gang leaders that were in my neighborhood, right? I would like observe these guys. It's like, you know, what makes an individual, right, have so much influence that other people are willing to follow, whether, you know, positive or not so positive. There's still something there, right? What is that, right? The captain of the football team, the head of the track team, right? What is it that's allowing these individuals and the more I started studying it, it was like, it's leadership. But growing up in Compton, I didn't know it was leadership. At the time. I just knew that it was something about that person. It wasn't until I joined the army that it really kind of, you know, got a real definition and got a face on it. So then when you start putting yourself around other, again, mentors and people that you look up to, right? You go to those people and you say, hey, what can I do to get to where you are? And that's when, again, those people say, well, tell you what, from what I noticed, you're good at this, you're good at that, and you're good at this. 
So take those three things and then let's figure out your path moving forward. And that's what really helped me. So it was definitely somebody else seeing it in me first before I saw it in myself. And I think a lot of people, I tell them that, you know, sometimes we get stuck because we're looking at things the way we see it versus the way it is. And I was um, speaking at a church um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was telling them about the, you know, the process. It doesn't matter where you come from. Everybody can identify this. Remember, Dave, when we were younger and our parents would always buy us clothes that was bigger than what we really <laughs> fit? And we used to hate it, Dave. It was like, mm -hmm. oh, why are you buying me these pants? They're too big. Why are you buying me this jacket? I can't fit this right now. Now, some of us would say the practical side is we didn't have a lot of money, so and you're going to be growing fast, so I'm going to buy this bigger so that way, you know, it can last longer. Mm -hmm. I flip it, Dave, and say it's more of a leadership principle now. Sometimes in life, right, we have to walk, be a part of, be tied to things that are bigger than us so that we can grow to that next level. And to me, I've always seen that and it's worked. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that's a fact, man. I, I remember my mom, you know, right. we'd go to, go to Sears or JC Penney's and yep, yep. Get, <laughs> we'd try find the size that fits us and then get one size bigger. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We did. <laughs> Uh, and you know, not too much with the shoes because we we always went to Kmart to get the shoes because yep. we we're yep. tear, tearing them up so quick, so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so true. And the thing about it, again, it's one of those principles that holds itself to be true, right? Every one of us eventually grew into that size that we thought we would never grow into and would take forever and why are they wasting my time? And, and then how about this, Dave? We felt like embarrassed. It's like, oh man, the kid's gonna make fun of me. You know, not knowing that everybody had the same problem, but at that time you're just focusing on yourself. But the principle never changed. We all grew into something that we didn't know we would grow into and we didn't know when we were growing into it. But the fact of the matter is, we grew into it. And to me, that's what leadership is. We can always grow into whatever it is, right, that we're traveling into, whether if you want to be a good father, right, you want to be a good coach, right? When you first started off as a father, you started off as a coach, you didn't know everything, right? You had an idea of what you wanted to be, but the truth of the matter is none of us really know. But over time, and I guarantee everybody can agree with this, the times that we fail the most were probably the time that prepared us to be a better father or a better coach, right? Or a better leader. Because sometimes, Dave, and you know this, we grew up with the mindset that, oh my gosh, you know, when we run into failure, that's the end of it all, right? But as you get wiser, you learn that, no, 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 failure is a part of success. Because most of us learned our best lessons after a failure versus when we got something right. Yeah. I was I was actually uh, gonna touch on that with you. I was wondering mm -hmm. if if you've got any particular experiences that uh, really help shape who you are and and your leadership philosophy. Um, maybe a, a lesson learned that uh, you know could help somebody that uh, hasn't learned that lesson yet. Absolutely, man. I have so many, but one I'm going to give you guys is when I was traveling as an operations officer, one of the jobs that we had where we actually got to drive in the motorcade, right? So cool, right? I would get there, well, we would get there like six days before the president, right? So that whole time you're setting up, you're doing this. And one of my roles was after the team was situated, I'm taking care of them, right? The day before I would go drive the route, right? That they're going to drive. Yes, in the motorcade, it's going to be police officers and all that leading the way. But that morning of, I had to make sure we got to the airport. And man, I never forget, we did this um, trip to Miami, Florida. And this particular airport, it had a bunch of the little circles, 
right? So as you're going there, right, you have to go through this circle, this circle. Now, this is pre-GPS and all that, right? This is just you going by memory. And they had four circles, Dave. I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to remember these four circles. I drove that route at least five times because I wanted to make sure on my way to the airport because there's going to be a trip officer that's going to ride with me. And then once we got in the motorcade, we'd be fine. So how about the morning of, right? We're driving and um, I never forget the guy named Mr. Steve Smith, one of my mentors to this day. So we're riding. He's like, so tell me about yourself, right? Where'd you grow up and all this? And I'm trying to focus on the road. Like, dude, please don't talk to me right now because if I miss one of these four turns, we're going to be in trouble. And I'm listening to him and I'll drive it and daggone it, Dave, I missed one of those circles. Instead of coming out the, the right way, I came out the wrong way. So now I have this dilemma. It's like, do I tell this guy that I'm lost or do I just like try to fake it and try to see if I can find something that looks familiar? And it finally got to the point where I was like, you know what? You know, if they're gonna get rid of me, if they're gonna fire me, I might as well just go down you know, with my integrity. I was like, hey, sir, I just want to let you know that right now we're lost. I was like, but I promise, I promise you, I drove this route five times yesterday mm -hmm. and I knew that this could happen. That's why I did it. And because I was honest, Dave, he was like, hey, don't worry about it. He said, like, keep going a little further. Found a guy on the street. He goes, hey, pull over. And I'm like, what? He said, like, go ahead and pull over. So I'm pulling over. This is the trip officer. He's in charge of the whole trip, right? And we're both trying to get to the motorcade. This is the time where you only had beepers. Right, so his beeper was blowing up. The airport officer was like, where are you guys? You know, they're about to set the motorcade. <laughs> and um, cause our vehicle was one that they would put, you know, certain pieces of equipment in there so that we can communicate. So he jumps back in the car, says, hey, there's a back way to the airport, follow this way and we're gonna go. Instead of him panicking, right, he goes right back into, so Dave, tell me about, you know, growing up in Compton, what was that like? And I'm like, man, this guy is like the calmest guy I've ever met. <laughs> we get to the airport, right? Secret Service is like, hey, you know, you got to help me get your vehicle together. The airport officer runs to him like, what the heck happened? I'm sweating bullets here. And the trip officer tells the guy, basically, hey, one for Darrell, we wouldn't have made it here on time. I'm like, huh? And the guy's like, what? He's like, yeah, we got lost. We had to find a different way of getting there. Uh, and luckily, you know, he got us here. So the airport officer like, man, what's your name again? He's like, you're new, right? I'm, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to look for you down the road. So we do the trip. Everything is great. We get to the end of the trip. And I'm like, Mr. Smith, why did you tell him, right, that, you know, I got us here on time versus the fact that I got I got us lost. And Dave, he taught me one of my first big leadership lessons at the White House. He said, listen to me. He said, when you're in this job, a lot of people are already nervous. They're already scared, right? They don't want to mess up. The last thing you want to do is feed their fear. He said, you want to always do the opposite, right? You want to build them up. No, you don't want to lie to them, but you want to focus on what can they do better? What can they do next? So his lesson to me was, you know, you're going to be in charge someday and somebody's going to mess up. You need to give them the same grace that I gave you and you need to find a way to turn their mistake, right, into something that they can learn from because that's how you build up a great organization, right? When you got a lot of people that's looking out for each other instead of, right, stabbing each other in the back and trying to make somebody look bad to be successful, he said, a great organization can't stand that way. He said, but when you start pouring into people and focusing on, you know, their gifts versus, right, their mistakes, that's when you start changing mindsets. That's when you get a young generation of talented people and you help them to bridge that gap of the experience that they're going to need, right? Because we need these guys for the long haul, right? And we don't want them, you know, walking out there having doubt. And that was just, to me, man, just one of the greatest lessons that I learned, even to this day, right? When people make mistakes, teams that I'm in charge of, I'm always quick to like, okay, where's the grace in the story, right? That I can salvage them to let them know that, hey, man, I made a mistake. I made many mistakes, right? And I'm in charge. So guess what? Consider this a learned lesson. Yeah, that's, that's huge. And, and you don't see that very often. You don't see many people in positions of authority that 
take the opportunity to provide grace uh, mm -hmm. when somebody makes a mistake. But hands down, every time anybody has offered me that opportunity, mm -hmm. without fail, everybody that I knew at the time would have right. put that person on a pedestal as one of the greatest leaders. Yes. And that's, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. What a, what a great lesson. And man, <laughs> I can't imagine what you were feeling at that time. <laughs> Dave, it definitely was not a person that thought that they deserved grace. That was for sure, man. Because like I told you, why does we the K to ADC, the best of the best? And it's like, okay, where do we get this guy from? Oh, he's from Compton? Yeah, we kind of expected he'd make mistakes like that, right? I just didn't want that concept, right, to follow me. I always wanted to be kind of like, you know, people say they have a little chip on their shoulder, but it's like, you know, I really did. It's like, I want to prove that, you know, success can come from any part of the tracks. It doesn't matter as long as you're willing. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Before we go, is there anything that, that we haven't talked about that you feel we should uh, impart upon the audience? Dave, I think you kind of hit a lot of it. I mean, some big stuff there, right? Finding your purpose, right? Trying to meet a need, looking for mentors, uh, maximizing your call. I mean, to me, these are all tangible action steps right? That again, anybody in life, I don't care, again, if you work in business, nonprofit, right? Public school system, right? You can apply these things to a life. But that's the good thing I love about leadership, right? There's never too many leaders. We can never have enough leaders. And everybody has an opportunity to be a leader, right? I was on a podcast um, last week and somebody was asking me, right? Do I think leaders are you know, taught or born. And I always tell them it's both, right? There's some leaders that are born, but they still fine tune their skills. And there's some leaders that I don't even want to be in charge, but yet because of your integrity and your honesty, you know, you find yourself being in charge because the fact that you don't want to be in charge is probably one of the greatest leadership assets that you already bring to the table because now you're not doing it from a sense of authority, but you're bringing it, you know, from a sense of responsibility. And um, so I, I just think I always tell anybody, there's not a problem in the world that effective leadership cannot solve. You know, before we go, there's something sure. that, that is, um, that just kind of came to, to my mind here. Mm -hmm. So I'm in central Florida and okay. there are several low income areas around central Florida. There is one place in particular. So I, I had the, the privilege of working with this young uh, firefighter who awesome. uh, came from this community. It's called Timber Scan. Okay. Um, and uh, I'd say within the last five years, it, it no longer exists. As a matter of fact, that when um, I believe every single building in that community had been condemned, but there were still people living in there. Sure. And uh, there was, um, you know, there was fires there, you know, there was a pretty high crime rate in that yeah. area. There, there wasn't too many kids growing up in that neighborhood that pursued higher education mm -hmm or even government service. Right. Um, it, it, I don't think really was in their, uh, in their view of something that uh, they could experience success in. Sure. You know, and, and this one individual that um, I, I got to work with, got to, got to know a little bit, uh, he grew up in that neighborhood. He was, um, the, the son of Haitian immigrants. Mm -hmm. And he went on to earn his bachelor's degree. And when wow. he uh, graduated, he went to the fire academy, became a, a firefighter awesome. and, and sought out a position where he could work in that same part of town, which is 
one of the busiest parts of town. Sure. You know, he, he could have went to another station somewhere else and, and not had to uh, work that hard. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But he, he wanted to be an example in his community, the community that he grew up in, because he knew that there weren't a lot of people that looked like him yes. and the people that he grew up with. And I'm, I'm curious, in your time in the military and, and in government service, mm -hmm. have you had an opportunity to reach out to members of communities like the one that you grew up in Mm -hmm. and and help raise those individuals up and and be that example um and it, and it sounds like you have because you you mentioned earlier that you did a lot of volunteering with uh community-based organizations mm -hmm. um but I, i'm curious like what is it that what is it that you say and what is it that you do that encourages these young men and women and you know the the you know quote unquote bad parts of town you sure, know where sure. it's it's lower income higher crime rate mm -hmm. tendency to you know hear sirens and helicopters a yes. lot more often than other parts so how do you change that mindset of that isn't the kind of occupation that's going to be very welcoming to somebody like me. Dave, that is an awesome question. And for that very reason, it's why when I got out of the military, I started my motivational speaking business because I knew, like I said, I was a product of that. I don't remember anybody coming to Compton, right? When I was there for those four years, right? Or three years at the time, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. I mean, they just, like if anything, they tried to avoid going there because they knew it was just, you know, too, a lot of craziness. So that same typing teacher that I told you earlier, right? One thing about her was so great, man. She would always tell me, Dave, not if, but when you make it, I need you to come back and talk to other students, right? She saw something in me that I didn't even see fully at that time, right? I'm like, oh, Miss Ferguson, you know, I'll be back. And she's like, no, I'm serious. <laughs> I, I need you to come back. And talk to these students. So one thing I used to do was, you know, at the time, you know, we used to give us like pictures and stuff of the White House and all that. And like I would send those pictures to her and she would post them up on her wall, right, in the classroom. And I remember uh, I told her I was coming to LA, President Clinton's going to be there. And, you know, so I would like pick a day, like, hey, what day do you need me to come? Because I want to come talk to your students. So I used to do that quite a bit. But when I retired, right, I stayed in the DC. Uh, Maryland, Virginia area. But to me, I had made a promise that, you know, again, I was going to always try to pay it forward. So um, I go to a lot of the um, public uh, schools in um, Maryland and DC, not as much as Virginia because of the distance. And you're right, you know, I did my homework. You know, it was like, you know, when I go into these places, right, what am I going to say? Because I want them like I said, not to remember me as much as the way I got to where I was. And it was so funny, man, because I would be in there and we would be escorted by some, someone would have like these ROTC candidates or they'd have, you know, these high rising students that they would allow to be our guests. And Dave, I would ask them, right? I was like, hey, uh, how many of these career days you've been a part of? And they're like, oh, this is like my, you know, fourth one. I'm like, hey, who are the great speakers and who are the ones that you guys like, man, I wish that guy never came. And he's like, are you serious, mister? I'm like, yeah, I'm serious. And what they told me, Dave, was the people that talked over their head, the people that bragged, right? Those are the ones that they didn't get anything out of. So I took that and I made sure that was in my presentation. I would never brag about myself. And if I did make an accomplishment, I would always preface it with the same way I made those types of decisions, you can make those decisions, right? The same way I joined the military, there's somebody waiting for you that can help you get to your path. 
So those were the things, instead of me trying to tell them like something, I would try to find a way to motivate them, right? Finding out, you know, like, you know, obviously I asked them like, hey, you know, what do you want to be, right? When you get a chance and obviously number one thing was sports star, um, musician, right? Or rapper at that time, right? And then an athlete, right? So it's like, okay, got it, got it. But instead of focusing on that end result, let's focus on what do you think those things are that got them to where they got? And that's where you say, help me, Dave. We would start, basically we were, you know, mind shifting, right? We were talking about habits. We were talking about, you know, finding mentors and those type of things. And then when they started giving me these answers, cause it wasn't me giving it to them, I'm asking them, right? And I used to travel with these coins, right? We said these cool White House coins, right? So every place I went to, I have a coin. When somebody gave me a nugget, right? I was like, dude, come up here, get this. You are the man. That is exact answer I'm looking for. So now I'm rewarding behavior that I want to replicate, right? And as they were giving me these answers, I would sum it all up and say every habit, right? Every decision that you guys talked about, all of those things put together is what got me to the White House. It's what got me out of Compton, right? I would tell, like some people say, well, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm like, that's fine, but I'm from Compton or inside of Los Angeles. And for me, I think me being authentic, right? Being transparent, because I would tell them, they're like, hey, my life is an open book. You can ask me any question. Are you serious? And they were like curious, man. They wanted to know, how does a dude from Compton make it to the White House? How do you fly on Air Force Two without somebody arresting you, <laughs> right? I mean, it was crazy <laughs> stuff they would say, right? And I would tell them like the way I dress, the way I carry myself, right? The way I even signed my name, I used to tell them like, even before I knew I was gonna be somebody, right? I would practice writing my name like if I was gonna sign a book and they were like, why would you do that? I was like, oh, what if I do write a book? right? I want my handwriting to look kind of smooth. Wouldn't you want to do that? And they were like, oh yeah, they would connect the dots. So for me, it was, you know, meeting them where they were, showing them that it was possible, but the key was providing them with action steps and then being honest with them, Dave, just telling them like, hey man, everybody's not gonna, you know, get that first record deal and sell, you know, platinum, right? And if that's not you, what else can you do that can sustain you until you get that moment? Or, you know, what if you don't make it as an athlete? What's wrong with being an agent, right? Giving them opportunities and alternates. They're like, oh, what's an agent do? I'm like, oh man, an agent takes 10, 15, sometimes 20% of what the other person makes. And you're like, oh man, that's, again, just teaching them how to dream. I think that's the other thing I would say, Dave, just teaching them how to dream and letting them know that again, what they see in front of them. And like you described, what you see in your neighborhood, right? That's not the end all be all. I said, however, and I used to tell them this, know that when you come from neighborhoods like that, or you come from a farm where there's just so much work and you have to work with your hands all the time. I said, what well, all those places have in common is they're developing your mental toughness. And I guarantee, I don't care what industry you find yourself in, all of you are gonna need mental toughness. So not if, but when you make it, I want you to think back, right? About that town in Florida, about that city in DC, right? That project in Chicago. And I want you to know that your mental toughness came, right? From your trials, right? And that put you on the path to where you're going. I said, so never use right? All your hard struggles and challenges as an excuse, right? But let that be motivation to say, because I came from those places, I'm more mentally tough than others. And I, I really appreciate you sharing that with me. That um, That is actually one of the biggest things. In, uh, you may be familiar with that, that speech that um, Teddy Roosevelt gave uh it's commonly re referred to as the man in the arena yes yes and that is what you just described you know that having that grit that level of mental toughness mm -hmm. where there is no such thing as giving up yes 
and and that's what the the people that lead others to success those individuals are the ones that have that mental toughness and and can show the way absolutely and the thing about it Dave, what i tell people is it comes in different forms right one thing i love 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 is all you guys doing these podcasts man this is such a powerful platform man you get to bring positivity every time you do a show you're bringing in people from all over the world right and again i was listening to you know when your show this morning man and i got so many nuggets from it right i'm sharing it with my wife right because she has a podcast to do at five and we were both like just excited right like i mean cause of you dave you excited us this morning from a previous show that you had already did so again, that's an example that, you know, whatever platform we have, right? Whatever tool that we're given, whatever talent that we're given, as long as we try to use it for positiveness and use it for good, like you'll never know the influences that you're making. Like, you know, before you and I met, you would have never known how much my wife and I enjoyed that podcast. So again, you know, you're doing a show for whatever reason that you started it but you will never know the influence that you are having just by doing, you know, probably one of your new passions. I really appreciate you saying that. And, and thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it, it's interesting because like, until talking to you, I hadn't thought of the guy that I told you about. I think that he would be a really good guest. Like, I think he would have Absolutely. a lot to share. Um, That's good. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to reach out to him uh, today and see if, uh, if he'd be interested. Hey, that's uh, awesome, man. That is so cool. Darrell, thank you so much for coming on and, and, and thank you for your service. I look forward to keeping in touch with you because I, Absolutely. I, feel like this was a really good conversation and um you know i i'd love to have you back on again and uh thank you for having me i love your platform and hopefully by the time we you know hook up again man i'll have the book finally finished i'm only on chapter four or 15 but definitely um hoping to maybe have one there that you can kind of give out to one of your uh, listening audience members yeah awesome thank you all right man have a great one uh you too Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, Please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.